Hello again, and welcome to part 3 of the 2014 Nationals Ukraine analysis. This one is coming a few weeks later than the first two parts, mainly because, like I said in part 1, this is a topic that's going to change a lot as the situation evolves, and the debate when Nationals happens may be very different than the debate as was envisioned when the topic was chosen. So in particular, I want to talk about things that happened between the first week of May and the first week of June, how they changed the situation in Ukraine, and what that means for the arguments that each side is going to be making. So for starters, let's look at a snapshot of what's going on in Ukraine right now. Things are relatively peaceful in most of the country. Most of the conflict is still confined to the east. There's a lot of conflict in particular around Donetsk, which is a city that's been taken over by separatists. It's just a little bit north of Crimea to the far east of Ukraine. Again, that's not an absolute control thing. That's a mostly in control to the point that government services can't be provided, police can't patrol the streets, etc. Ukrainian forces recaptured the airport near there with some casualties on both sides, but there's been a trend towards air power in a lot of recent Ukrainian strikes. Usually when they sent ground troops, the ground troops would surrender and switch sides, get captured, or be outgunned and have to retreat. Lately they've been using airstrikes instead, which is bad for fighting an insurgency, but good for something that US aid or NATO aid could help. And what I mean by that is airstrikes are never going to eradicate a rebellion entirely, but they will stop becoming an army and starting open warfare. They can target large numbers of people, but they can't target individual people, they can't pick out leaders, and they can't avoid civilian casualties if people are fighting in a city or fighting guerrilla warfare. So generally speaking, what the airstrikes are doing is preventing the insurgents from reaching a critical mass where they could form their own army and fight in open warfare. What they are not doing is actually resolving the situation. Generally speaking, Ukrainian forces have been more successful since they started accepting some civilian casualties as a possibility for their missions. Back when they said, we won't do something if it could result in civilian casualties, they weren't getting results. Now they are getting results, but civilian casualties are one of those results, which means on the one hand that the Nets could be retaken by the Ukraine National Army, but on the other hand, that could also reify Putin's narrative that Ukraine doesn't care about its own Russian-speaking civilians, and that it will kill them to keep its national power strong, and that only he cares about them. So Ukraine definitely is trying to walk a line without causing excessive civilian casualties, without playing too much into Russian propaganda, but without appearing too weak, and without letting separatist forces reach a critical mass where they can actually start mounting military-style offensives. On the political side of things, Poroshenko, as most people expected, won the election in Ukraine. Relatively speaking, the elections went much better than they could have. Yulia Tymoshenko was a distant second. The extreme candidates to both sides received single digits of the vote. So, of the two mainstream-ish candidates, the less anti-Russian one, but also the more pro-NATO one, ended up getting elected. Poroshenko, during his previous government post, advocated Ukraine trying to get on a fast track to join NATO. He did not campaign on that. Whether he advocates that afterwards remains to be seen. There are a couple ways that teams could spin this. They could say, for instance, that he still wants to, but he didn't campaign on it because he didn't want to divide. They could say that it's kind of like where Obama has said on issues that his views were evolving while he was running for election until they pulled well enough and then advocated the view he'd actually had all along. They can say that he may want it personally, but that he's not going to politically advocate for it, that he wouldn't say no if NATO offered. They could say that he's had his views actually changed since then. There's a bunch of ways different teams could spin this that will answer questions as far as does Ukraine say yes, does Ukraine say no to various offers from NATO. What Poroshenko has done, however, is cut out the middleman and ask for direct U.S. military aid, which, as I said before, 
helps a lot in terms of airstrikes, but doesn't help too much in terms of actually changing the situation or permanently ending the situation, but it is one way that a message could be sent by NATO or by the U.S., and that they could strengthen their relationship with Ukraine by doing what Ukraine's current leadership wants. So the election, as I said, was seen as fairly legitimate, except in some of the eastern sections. Even in those sections, Poroshenko won. It's the first election in a long time in Ukraine where the same candidates won all around the country. Generally speaking, Ukraine splits east and west in elections the same way that the U.S. splits between red states and blue states, where states along the east coast, New England and the west coast, tend to vote one way, while states in the heartland tend to vote the other. Ukraine is the same way, but splitting more along ethno-linguistic lines. So that's one thing that could undermine the legitimacy of the election, is that the people in the areas that normally wouldn't vote his way weren't able to make it to the polls. Another thing that could also have some ominous effects regarding the election, if one team tries to spin this as the crisis has passed, things are coming down, is that before the election, several eastern parts of the country got together and said that they are now the country of Novorossia, or New Russia, which doesn't imply any interest in voting for any Ukrainian candidate, but more interest in aligning themselves with whatever Russia is going to do next. So aside from that, the other thing to keep in mind with Poroshenko is that he specifically called for the U.S., and that can either be spun as, but he would say yes to NATO too, or but he would like more allies than just the U.S. if he can get it, or it could be spun as because he thinks NATO is ineffective, because he thinks only the U.S. can directly deter Russia. So aside from that, pre-election pro-articles. Articles written before the election that said that we need to strengthen NATO's relationship with Ukraine before the elections, after that it will be too late. Many of those are now con articles. They're saying, okay, these are reasons that we did need to, these are reasons that we would have been able to make a difference, but now we can't anymore. Sometimes even the authors of those articles don't actually believe those claims, but they are placed there to give a sense of urgency to it, some kind of tipping point. The trouble is, once those tipping points have passed, many of those authors simply find new tipping points, while others are a bit more analytic and look for reasons the tipping point has changed. They might say, for instance, well, we said that NATO needed to involve itself before the elections, after that it's too late, may also say, well, that was true when I wrote it, but since then Russia's backed off a little bit, and the situa situation with China has complicated things, so as a result, the new tipping point is this time. Take a look at all your evidence, though. Make sure that it doesn't have a tipping point before the tournament. Otherwise, it becomes con evidence that this might have been a good idea in the past, but it is too late now. The other two big things to take a look at that have changed since then, and will be changing between now and nationals, is Russian forces withdrawing and Russia's deal with China. So, generally speaking, you'll see articles that say Russia has promised to withdraw its forces, Russia is pulling its forces back, NATO doesn't believe Russia will pull back its forces, and that's what you're going to have to wade into and straighten out. NATO has claimed that even though Russia has promised to back its forces off from the Ukrainian border, that their satellite imagery still shows them there. Aside from that, there's a debate on whether or not backing them off from the border actually matters in anything more than a symbolic sense, because Russia isn't sending them to any other areas that are particularly urgent, they could easily have those troops back at or across the border in very little time, especially given what's going on in Crimea right now. Russia, to try and solidify its hold permanently on Crimea, has been invoking the same kinds of decrees and laws that it used in Sochi before the Olympics, where it's basically taking land and turning it into government land in the name of strengthening the economy, but also in a way of making Crimea more Russian, so to speak. So that way, even if there is a popular push to give it back to Ukraine, they can say, well, it's too late, it's become a Russian government center, we have all these vital government resources here, we've moved a lot of Russian people to here, we can't give it back now. So that's one thing that's going on. The other thing that's going on, besides Russia's posturing around the edge of Ukraine and in Crimea, is 
Russia's deal with China. Hundreds of billions of dollars in liquid natural gas going to China means a couple things. It means Russia depends less on the EU and therefore on NATO members. It means that Russia depends more on China and it means whoever got the better deal out of that, the other one may feel they have to watch out for the other country involved. And Russia is starting to think of China as more of a geopolitical rival and starting to realize that it may need credibility with the EU, may need positive relations with Europe and with the United States in order to be able to hedge against China. And there's certainly evidence out there that says that since this deal, Russia has decided that their times of needing to play nice with China to get the deal are more or less taken care of, and that now they need to worry more about balancing their relations with China against their relations with the U.S. and with the EU in the hopes that the U.S. and the EU will help them contain China should China start to become problematic to Russian national interests along their very long shared border. So, generally speaking, when you are looking at Russia and China, you're looking at who got the better of that deal, does it make the countries more likely to cooperate, less likely to trust each other, does Russia see China as enough of a rival that it will back off from Ukraine without NATO influence, and if so, would more NATO influence antagonize Russia into coming back in, or just help guarantee that Russia stays back off? So those are some of the questions that the past couple weeks have brought up, some to be resolved, others as new questions to be asked, and those are things that you want to be following closely to see how they develop between now and nationals. Hope that helps. As always, you should have several ways to reach me. If you have other questions about this, feel free to leave comments. I will try to answer them promptly.